This is Jeremiah. We're back. We're going to finish Galatians. And uh, let's do that as we greet you in the only name given amongst men. We've got a chapter and a half to do, and we'll finish up Galatians. I'll probably take a nap here, and uh, we'll probably look at... I'm surprised we have so many videos here. But we'll, we'll probably take a look at... Um, the book of Psalms here, or John 17, 18. And we have yet to get into Isaiah. We were, we went through Psalms, and I just pointed out a few scriptures. We touched on the Song of Solomon, talking about poetry and how beautiful poetry is in your Bible, and the and the concept of love. And how jealousy is stronger than death, and all of these wonderful scriptures. And we just enjoy the Bible here together. Now, I did, I have to check my notes on Isaiah. Um, I think we left off, I, I'll, I'll do this later. We, we had a wonderful time on chapter 5, verse 1. And two, uh, uh, two of the most beautiful scriptures in your Bible, uh, top 100. We're talking about beloved and you being beloved, and that's one of the main terms in agape. And one of our um, citations on the word beloved in the context is 5.1.2 of Isaiah, big time. And uh, we, we just looked at that. I haven't seen that scripture in a long time, but I've decided to make it a heavy hitter. Something that we talk about a lot here, okay? As we get into beloved and love and agape, and of course we just looked at um, father and sis, and uh, so far I only have Psalms in there. We might add five one and two. Five one and two of Isaiah are absolutely monstrous, people. Uh, scriptures. As we start talking about heavy hitters in our Bible. As we start going through the Bible, we're going to start hammering home the major scriptures that I want to give to share with you. It doesn't mean they are the major scriptures. It just means that I'm going to select some that I think are definitely home run hitters. And we're going to talk about them a lot here. As we, as Remember, we're focusing on beauty and love and the rapture here and living bread heavily. Those are some of the main concepts we deal with in this ministry. I've decided to do that for the past couple of years. In other words, for a year and a half, we've been really focusing on love, agape. What is love? What is it? What is agape love? What is beauty? Why is love and beauty all, why are they always together? Why are love and beauty basically always together? Why is God always dealing with beauty? If you sit back and think about it, why is he always prioritizing beauty and he lets people ruin beauty of the earth, but he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. So there you go. Everything with God basically deals with beauty. He, he, he will not live without beauty. Ecclesiastes 3.11, that's 7.5 in this ministry. He makes everything beautiful. You say, Jeremiah, you've been hitting that pretty hard. We'll never stop hitting that. We'll back off a little, but we, 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 we've been really hammering that home. And I just turned to Isaiah 5, 1 and 2. Uh, now I will sing to, to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out of the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and, and also made a wine press therein and looked that, I'm, I'm sorry, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved. It doesn't get any better than that. Once you start getting into these scriptures and honing in on them, this is where you belong. We still talk about the beast. I'm going to have a lesson on the book of Revelation. We're going to talk about beasts coming from the earth, very ugly creatures, murdering people. Uh, you know, a couple of billion people are going to be murdered by these creatures. 
But, but that's the antithesis of where, we're, where we are. We, we, we're, we're focusing on these scriptures now. Now, I'm not going to read these scriptures over and over. What I'm saying is, is that this is, where you, this is where you should park. It's been time. Give me, give me a moment for coffee here. One moment. Uh, I apologize for this. One moment. I don't like drinking while I'm teaching, but I've gotten so comfortable here. The Lord has made me some kind of a king here. Uh, if, if anybody deserves not to be a king, it's probably me. But, you know, if, if God blesses you, rejoice in it. Don't complain. I was helping Sister Hill, a very nice lady. She was 101 years old, and we were helping her do a few items with her, with her son, who's a friend of mine. And we were helping her. She's a wonder, she was a wonderful lady. She just passed away at 102. And she was very alert at 101. She was, uh, she was totally alert. She was handling her bills and everything. Here's my point. Is that she told me that when people give you something, be careful not to hurt their feelings. Go ahead and receive it. And, and, and that's part of Christianity, that, that uh, you know, re receive from the Lord. Some people think because we teach daily bread, which is denial is going to happen to you, face it, man up, that we don't, we don't want to enjoy anything. And this, this is purely asinine. It's the devil. Or it's flesh. As we just looked at right here in Paul. That, that's the flesh. You know. Take up your cross daily. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I want to talk about enjoying things. Listen, we, we do both here. We, we, we talk about daily cross, open to difficulties, long-suffering for the benefit of the Christian people. But we also rejoice in good things we get in our bodies right now. You can do both. And especially when you're laying down your life for the brethren, you're looking at Luke chapter 6 monstrously, aren't you? Men will give to you, pressed down, shaken together. They're going to give you what? Love. You're going to get koinonia while you're in this body. You're going to get Father's agape love. We just looked at Paul saying, we cry, Abba, Father. Didn't we just read that? Huh? Galatians 4, 6, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. I just wrote a song. We, we just had a, a we just wrote a, a lesson. Father insists. Father insists on giving you good things. We're not here to hammer home denial of Stanley and Livingston in the jungle for the benefit of others. That's the only component to living bread and, and serving Jesus Christ. We go everywhere here. We live by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Let's get back to Galatians. You cry, Abba, Father. Paul spends most of his time telling you to learn to be a servant. Put this mind in you, a servant mind. Put this mind in you, put this mind in you, servant, servant, servant. Then he says, oh, you're now a son, and you cry, I love daddy. Do we only teach your servant and a bond slave and suffer for Christ? No. Your brain should be able to, to, to process both of these servant-child dichotomy here. You should be able to do that. A fourth grader who's paying attention and who's honest, you're going to get what I just told you. Slavery and father loves you. 
That's, that's what Christianity is. Now, why does the Bible focus on slavery, bond slavery, and servanthood most of the time? Well, that's the way it is. Paul does not focus on you being an adopted child most of the time. When he talks to Timothy, does he talk about being a, 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 a child who's special in the heart of father? No. Does the master do that in the red letters? No. And what's the reason for that? Because you need to develop a servant mind big time. When he, when he says you cry out, Abba, Father, here's what happens when you develop a servant mind. You automatically cry, Abba, Father. But if you do not establish a servant mind and let this mind be in you, which is laying down your life for the brethren, you'll never know, Abba, Father. And this becomes a big issue. Let's talk about this before we move on. The big issue here is that is it Galatians 4, 6, or 4, 5, and 6, uh, this beautiful situation of father being close to you, la, 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 la. father's close to you, loves you dearly, uh, he's very close to you. It's father's son all the way here, man. Woo-hoo! It's not going to happen without the servant mind indoctrination that's the point some some people will try and take you i saw a tv preacher say that uh, galatians 4 6 is where you start your christianity and that's called uh, wrong answer there is no way for you to own new wine in old wineskins and that's what paul is telling you here that you are sons based upon you getting your doctrine correct. There is no adoption without you getting on the narrow brick road and getting, get, getting in line with the feast of unleavened bread. Make straight ye the ways of the Lord. Initiate a servant mind and cultivate a servant mind. Then at that point, we don't even need to tell you that you cried, Abba, Father, because that's the only way you're going to cry, Abba, Father. I saw a TV goon here a couple of months ago online. We don't have to be servants. We are privileged. And you're like God, and you give me a hundred dollars, and God's gonna give you a thousand. You'll be rich. God owes you money now. You've deserved. You've deserved money now. You deserve God's blessing now. And we're back to Galatians here in the flesh. More heretics, more twisters, more bewitched people. Lies. Lies will damn you. Sound doctrine will save you. That's why we stick to everything within this doctrine. It doesn't mean you can't make mistakes. These people in Galatians are making a mistake, and Paul's saying he's going to rebirth them. Didn't he say that? He's going to rebirth them. That's what he said, which means he's correcting them. He's fixing their wagon. Because without getting fixed, you're in trouble. He just said a little, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of pride, a little bit of sin, a little bit of greed, and the whole thing is ruined. Your Christianity, Galatians, can be ruined if you maintain this lie within the church. You're adding to the doctrine, you're twisting it, and you might be disqualified if you continue. Let's get everything back, our ducks in a row now, so we can, we can all relax and all say we're all saved, and we can have smooth fellowship. That's the point here. Let's look at um, Galatians 4.30. Cast out the bondwoman. You need to get rid of the Amalekites. People around you and things that 
teach things improper, get them out. I've had people knock on my door, these devils. I said, devil, I want you to leave out of front. Get, get away from here. Don't come back here anymore. And, and don't send your friends over here either. You're other devils. Teaching very similar things to the Galatian stuff. Okay? Let's go to... Let's go to Galatians 5 as we greet you in the only name given. We rejoice together with you in the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I just took you to Isaiah 5, 1 and 2, which we just looked at recently as new monsters in this ministry. As we start hammering home monsters, um, I just went to Proverbs, and I'm going to share what I consider to be some monsters there. As we start really writing down and hammering monsters here, Big time scriptures that are relative to uh, the heavyweights of your Bible. Now, this is just uh, obviously a, a selection of, uh, of heavyweights all over the place, but it's just what I've, what I've chosen, okay? And it generally centers around what? Living bread, beloved, agape. These are the main issues we talk about here. Now, when I'm going through Paul here, I'm basically isolating grace right now and grace and law, which is number four in this ministry, grace and mercy. That's what we're focusing on here most of the time. However, we're bouncing all over the place. We're talking about living bread, too, because living bread is for you to get in order here, and that's what he's, he's doing. He's getting them in order. So you preach the proper doctrine. And preaching the proper doctrine is how you're going to live. Obviously, this is along the lines of law and grace. Now, he's broadening it out, talking about Sarah and Hagar, and they both had children, and their children are results of their behavior. Abraham believed in God, and he trusted in God, he loved God, and he hungered and thirsted after righteousness, and he, he observed the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lamb of God, so he was saved. So his child is a child of freedom. The woman is in the flesh, and she believes in pride and effort, so her child becomes a child of effort, pride, violence, and the world. In other words, the, the, the bond woman is living on moon energy. She, the energy of the flesh, the energy of the devil, the energy of darkness. Pride, ability. And that person persecutes the one who believes in uh, God's grace. And that loving God and trusting in God is the way to go. For everything. Well, the person that trusts in themselves and stares in the mirror and violent, they hate the person who is not violent, doesn't stand, stare in the mirror, loves God, and relies upon God as their power and their glory. Let's go to chapter 5 of Galatians. Let's go to verse... Um, back to 12. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve one another. So we're back to heavy hitters again. Because we're not mentioning love. In other words, love is going to perform everything properly. When we insert love into our doctrine of, of study, of faith, of confidence in Jesus Christ, then we have winners on our hand. Everybody's going to do everything just right. 
basically. That's the way it goes. If I force you to perform and do things, I don't love you. People in the world can't love you who, 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 who base everything on performance. They, they say that, uh, uh, that, that Babe Ruth died alone in the hospital. Nobody was there with him. Why? Because he wasn't hitting home runs anymore. People love you in the world based upon performance. There's no shadow of turning with the Lord. If you're not performing well, he's still right there with you. If you don't look good around people, he's still with you. You're supposed to rely upon the Holy Spirit as your power and your righteousness that covers you, that makes you presentable. The only reason you're presentable to mankind, and in heaven especially, is that you're covered with purity of Jesus Christ. No one can see your sins. And you've got that covering based upon the completed work of Jesus Christ that you boast about, not anything you've done. And obviously people are going to get confused because... They don't understand that when, when James talks about works, he's talking about people who love Jesus Christ, they're going to get busy. Not based upon their performance of salvation, but based upon the fact that love performs and love acts. Love gets things done. But it doesn't save you because your actions are stained. Even though you do a lot of actions and God loves you for doing that, he loves you loving people. It doesn't save you. You can't use it as evidence for in court for salvation. It's evidence in court for you to have a testimony of the love of Jesus Christ. That's for sure. Let's continue. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. If you fight amongst other people, you're going to go down. And the royal law is obviously here in 14, 514. Everything is always summed up with, if you love your neighbor, you're going to do these things which are correct. And you're not going to insert Bad doctrine. Bad doctrine comes from a lack of love. That's why, that's why your confidence went twisted. You, you, you had confidence in the wrong thing, and that came from a lack of love. You embraced a lie, and so love hit, love hit the window, because love cannot be with, with lies. You can't do it. God can't hang around lies. God is love. If you hang around lies, you, you, God's going to leave you. If you believe in lies, which what they're believing in here is a lie, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit's going to leave them. Salvation's going to leave them. Bye-bye. You're not fulfilling the royal law anymore. You're not, you're, you're, not, you're not teaching the gospel in love anymore. You're not loving your neighbor by telling them lies, are you? No. That's why we add love to confidence. We always have love with our faith doctrine. Always. That way, our doctrine will always be pure and clean. Successful Christianity requires confidence in the proper doctrine with love. And these people have inserted lies into their doctrine as Christians, 
And that means that they're not fulfilling the royal law anymore. You better watch out. Because love of your, of your brethren always has everything in order and there's no pride involved. Love and pride cannot exist together. Love and greed cannot exist together. Therefore, greed and pride in the church is condemnation in the church. It's not really a church. This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk from Romans again, Paul's back into the law again. Listen, if you walk according to the commandments of Jesus Christ, that's walking in the Spirit. You have love in your heart, and, and, and you're sticking to the commandments, which are don't get puffy about what you do. If you get puffy about what you do, then the Spirit is no longer walking with you. The pedagogus we just observed, the paraclete, the paraclete's going to leave. The Holy Spirit hanging around you, bye-bye. But when you walk in the Spirit, you keep the truth on all the time. And you won't fulfill what your body wants to do. Your body wants to brag about what you do. Your body and your old man before you became a Christian. You want to brag about your accomplishments because it makes you feel good. And these things are the enemy of God. But if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Proud people are under the law. Performance people. Hagar. She and her boy, they're under the law. Because they're, they're performance people. Sin's okay. Lying's okay. Violence is okay. Everything's okay. Power. Staring in the mirror, bragging about this guy's accomplishments over here and her accomplishments over there. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, unclean, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, which, which, which is the main, to, the main term in this book, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you, before, as I have told you in time past, they that that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now we're going to a cross-reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, big time. That's the exact scripture he gave as far as to the Corinthians, which is, you better watch out, you better not cry. Stay on the narrow path, and all of these behaviors stay away from because if, if, if they get into you, then you're back in the flesh again. You're not walking according to the Spirit anymore. And you're in danger. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So when you were born again, and you were crucified with Jesus Christ, and you came out of the water, and you were now born in the Spirit, and all of these things in the flesh have nothing to do with you. You run from these behaviors as fast as you can. You flee this, as Joseph fled Potiphar's wife. You run away from bad things. Bye-bye. And when you stop running, you're in danger. Uh, eschewing evil, fearful of sinning. Obviously, many of you out there, you, you're going to have some problem with these uh, behaviors there. It's, it's easy to fall into these behaviors, but it's also just as easy to pray and to resist the devil and get out of these behaviors.
If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. We'll come back to chapter 6 tonight. And then I'll wrap up Galatians. And then I'm going to go to probably John 17. And we look at the, at the, at the Son praying to the Father. And the biggest scripture probably in John 17 is probably, probably uh, the last one. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. That's the big heavy hitter in that. In that. There are a lot of heavy hitters in John 17, but that is a monster. The whole goal here is to have God's love in you. And even though you may not be perfect in all of these kinds of issues, uh, the goal is for you to own this love now and, of course, to own it when you're in glory, big time. But he wants them to have it like right now because that's what he lives on. Jesus Christ lives on love, pressed down, shaken together, given to his bosom. That's what brings him joy, his Father's love. He talks about it over and over again all the time. And that comes through truth. That's why God says his foundation of his throne is truth. He sits on truth. Love cannot exist without truth. We're talking about real love. America uses the word love for everything. They, 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 they have an advertisement I saw yesterday. If you don't love the ice cream, send it back or something. Well, I would send it back immediately because I'm not Babylonian. I can't love ice cream. You see how sick the world is. You start throwing the word love around for ice cream, dogs, homes, and cars, you're a sick person because you're supposed to be talking about loving Jesus Christ. Maranatha, we'll, I'm done for now. Um, I'll be back tonight for, on my schedule. And we hope you're enjoying getting into the Word of God as we're headed for John 17, that big scripture, that, the, the, the love wherewith thou hast loved me. Woo! That's the enchilada right there. That's the big one. I'll be right back. Um, and you click the next video. We're going to finish uh, 6. As Galatians is a very deep book. Uh, Paul goes all over the place. He's a very deep writer. We just looked at David and the book of Psalms. And another deep writer. And I'll teach you how to put these concepts together. I separate these concepts. I only focus on a few concepts in the book. Okay? I limit my concepts when I teach most of the